Deep within the mountains of North Africa, I'm looking for the origins of an ancient legend, an incredible story that begins with Moses and the Ten Commandments. It's about an object so sacred, it can only be viewed by the most pure Christians. It's so dangerous, it can destroy cities, spread plague, and burn people alive. Many have looked for the source of this legend. The Crusaders, the Popes of Rome, the great kings of Europe, even Indiana Jones. And like them, my quest has brought me to Ethiopia. I'm looking for the keepers of the lost ark. My name is David Adams. I'm a photojournalist. And while I travel to many strange corners of the earth, I don't normally get a reception like this. Ethiopia is a landlocked nation in North Africa. Once a mountain kingdom, it remained isolated from the rest of the world for over a thousand years. Ethiopia is the only African nation never to be colonized, thanks to warriors like these. They wiped out invaders with ferocious efficiency. And this is how they developed battle courage. It's the ancient sport of quacks. It's a form of jousting, and as you can see, the rules are simple. Get out of the way fast. The spears are real and very sharp. That was incredible. I've never been chased like that in a horse ever. It's no wonder that Ethiopia has never been really occupied with guys like that chasing the people out of here. Just fantastic. Oh. <clears throat> but I come in peace. In fact, I come as a pilgrim. My journey starts in the Ethiopian highlands, where I'll shortly set out on a 200-mile pilgrimage. That's 320 kilometers. My journey will take me to some of the most sacred shrines in this ancient land. First stop is the town of Lalabella, where thousands of pilgrims are gathering for Christmas. Ethiopia is one of the world's oldest Christian nations, so I wear a white shawl to show respect, and I carry a pilgrim's staff for divine determination. My pilgrimage will take me through the 12 days of the Orthodox Christmas, ending with Timkat, the Ethiopian Feast of the Epiphany. But none of this happens on any dates we use in the West. According to the local calendar, there are 13 months in a year. The 21st century is still years away. And sitting here under the midday sun, it's still 5 p.m. In other words, Western time here is irrelevant. And listening to this fire and brimstone preacher, so are some aspects of Western culture. 
No coffee, he shouts. No alcohol, no loud talk, excessive laughter or noisy parties. Otherwise, I will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Not exactly my idea of Christmas. So to help me on my pilgrimage and guide me through this fundamental Christian country, I need expert help. I find it in this humble Lullabella home. So all these people just come from the street, you invite them in? Yeah, I invited them in my home. That's lovely. And then everybody does that for Christmas? This sure. is the custom? Yeah, it's the custom. It's our culture, yeah. This is Ishitu, his wife Ababa, and her cousin Tete. Tomorrow we leave on a family pilgrimage to the ancient city of Gonda. And these people have come from how far away? Uh, they came almost seven days and eight days from, they came from different really? parts of Ethiopia. Thank you. This looks this like you feed me for the day. Yeah. This is holy bread. Mm. It's astonishing and charity in a country so Christmas desperately poor. So out of respect, and despite the warnings of the fire and brimstone preacher, I try some of Ishitu's beer. Now it looks like Australian beer. Mm -hmm. Mm, it's not I bad. Don't like it. That's good. It's um, it's quite bitter. Mm -hmm. There's things floating in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe we'll export to your country. Somehow I don't think it will work. <laughs> <laughs> Before I set off as a pilgrim, I must learn more about Ethiopian belief. And in Lalabella, you don't have to go far. Here, the church is a thriving institution. One in five Christian males is a deacon or a priest. This is a Christmas liturgy, conducted as it would have been 1,500 years ago. The chanting, the robes, the mysticism, all belong to the deep biblical past. something that seems very African about this dance, it's actually one of the oldest liturgies in existence. It has its roots in the days when Christianity was a radical Jewish sect. And underlying it all is unswerving faith. They call Lalabella the New Jerusalem. There are 11 of these churches here, dating from the 12th century, and all of them are carved by hand out of solid rock. Hello. Hello. I'd like to buy some candles. Good here. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas. Churches are connected by a maze of tunnels. Over the centuries, they've been turned into catacombs. All around me are the bodies of long dead monks, skin and bone preserved in the dry mountain air. Passages twist and turn into an elaborate underground labyrinth. All of it chopped out of stone by hammer and chisel. But how? Well, according to legend, the heavy work was done by saints and angels. When King Lalabella died, God ordered him back to earth to carve the churches. And St. George and the Archangel Gabriel lent him a hand. Well, that's what the faithful believe. Here in Ethiopia, faith is an obsession. This woman has traveled for days to be rechristened at the Church of St. George. And these hermit monks 
will spend the rest of their lives in holes, reading and rereading their Bibles, until they too join the catacombs of the dead. Can you imagine it? They made this just with a hammer and chisel, and this is volcanic rock. If anything is an act of faith, this is. But inside the church is the source of an even deeper religious obsession. The Ethiopians believe that somewhere hidden behind these curtains is an object handed to Moses by God. It's the Ark of the Covenant, the box that held the Ten Commandments. Now I must say, I'd always believed it was destroyed when the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem in 586 BC. But here they believe it was brought to Ethiopia by Menelik, son of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. All over Ethiopia, hundreds of churches claim to possess it. It might be here, it might be elsewhere, but where? Well, that's the point of my journey. Tomorrow, I set out through the 12 days of Christmas on a pilgrimage. I travel to some of the most remote hiding places in Ethiopia on my quest for the secrets of the lost ark. Dawn on the first day of Christmas, and our pilgrimage is underway as we set out from Lalabella to the ancient Ethiopian city of Gonda. 200 miles or 320 kilometers is not a huge distance, but it's a long way to walk. Stage one takes us to Bethlehem, but not the biblical Bethlehem. There's a Bethlehem in Ethiopia too, and here I'll find a church that claims a unique connection with the Ark of the Covenant. Ishitu and Ababa have brought their son Zed and their little daughter Jordanus. And it isn't long before we're in the heart of the Ethiopian highlands. This is another reason why Ethiopia has been isolated for so long these amazing mountains. They're a natural barrier to invaders and explorers. And that includes people like me, investigating the legend of the lost ark. You know, if you were going to hide an object that was at the core of three of the world's great religions, this wouldn't be a bad place to do it. The Pilgrim's Trail takes us through some of the best farmland in the country. Only about 12% of Ethiopia is suitable for farming, which means that a population of 50 million Ethiopians depend on a few farmers like these to survive. No wonder it's so often a land of famine, and there's a drought on right now. These farming methods have hardly changed since biblical times. They still thresh grain here much in the same way as they did 2,000 years ago. No tractors or mechanized farm machinery here. By now we've done about 12 miles or 20 kilometers and the journey's beginning to take its toll on the youngest member of the group. Would you like me to take Jordy? Sure. Oh, you're getting very heavy. So why do it all on foot? 
Well, to achieve real redemption, a pilgrim must make a genuine effort. The more we walk, the closer we get to God, and the closer we get to our first destination, Bethlehem. This little town of Bethlehem is typical of the Ethiopian highlands. No power, no running water, not much land for crops or grazing, and desperately poor. We meet the Abba, or priest. If I want to know more about the Ark, I'd better not get on the wrong side of him. David Ibala Lesuka, Australia name it. Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> We've come a long way to see you. Like all guests, we must be made welcome, and that means coffee. They know all about making coffee here in Ethiopia, and so they should. Coffee gets its name from the Kaffir region of Ethiopia, the place, they say, where coffee beans were first discovered. It's always handed round with some ceremony here. Indeed, few conversations start without coffee. And there's a lot that I want to ask the Abba about the Ark. Has the church ever housed the Ark of the Covenant? There is the Ark, yeah. Yes, maybe. But I thought the genuine Ark, the one taken from the temple in Jerusalem, was supposed to be in Lalabella. There's an Ark here in the church, because every church they have their own Arcus, and we use one Ark for this church. So each church has its own Ark. Fair enough. But isn't there supposed to be only one Ark? The one brought down from Mount Sinai by Moses. Has this been the resting place of the central Ark? Tabotu. Oh. OK, right. But isn't there some confusion? There are now two churches, both claiming the genuine Ark. Since we are Christian, this is our Ark, he says. But surely the Ark can't be in a hundred places at once. Is he speaking literally or metaphorically? Both, he says. Now this is really confusing. The Abba shows me the Bethlehem church. It was built by people from Israel in the third century, he says, by foreigners who wished to protect the Ark, and it's well protected. This is as far as the Abba can go. Because he's recently eaten and made love to his wife, he's temporarily impure and cannot enter the consecrated part of the church. So I enter under the watchful eyes of his assistant. But there's another mysterious eye staring at me from behind the curtains. Is this the Ark of the Covenant? I'm warned not to step too close. Even for a skeptic like me, it would be wise to obey. But the real point is that these people believe that behind these curtains, there's an object that was touched by God and Moses himself. And if I was to go in there and touch it, flames would shoot straight up my nostrils and I'd be burned alive. I move back, just in case I'm zapped by the ark. That evening, as Tete and Ababa prepare our meal, I keep little Jordanus amused. I'm all prepared for a quiet and reflective night around the campfire, when suddenly, out of the shadow come these dancers. It's called, rather euphemistically, shoulder dancing and it's a strange mix of Christianity and paganism. It's a dance about two spirits, one good, the other mischievous. One serves God, the other serves the devil. 
Suddenly, my pilgrimage is on hold. And as I dance to music that sounds strangely Irish, I wonder which spirit will win, the good one or the mischievous one. Thank goodness the Ark is safely locked away in the church, far beyond the reach of skeptics like me. Tomorrow, I continue my quest for the keepers of the lost Ark. I take a shower under the thundering waters of the Nile and cross a bridge built with honey, eggs and clay. It's the fifth day of Christmas, and we wake up to the cool air of a North African winter's dawn. Soon we're back on the Pilgrim's Trail. Our route takes us from the Ethiopian Bethlehem back into the mountains as we head for the Blue Nile and the Tissasat Falls. But our pilgrim's progress is checked by one of the sadder realities of Africa. A cortege like this can only mean one thing, a funeral. In the crowd, we recognize one of the dancers from the night before. A 23-year-old cousin has died. As is the custom in small, close-knit communities like this, everyone attends including us. Like everywhere in Africa, death is part of life. It happens all the time. It's a real privilege to be here because uh, knowing the family, it's a very private moment for them and very, very special for me. I won't ever forget this. We're now well into our pilgrimage. We've got just over a week to go, but there's still 120 miles of hard slog ahead of us. I revel in this beautiful Ethiopian landscape, when suddenly, in the middle of nowhere, we see this. An old European-style bridge. Apparently, the Portuguese built it in the 15th century. So the story goes, there was no cement, so they stuck it together with honey, eggs and clay. We're now approaching the Blue Nile. And in the distance, a strange white mist. These are supposed to be some of the most spectacular waterfalls in North Africa. I see the wafting haze that gives them their local name, Tissasat, or the smoke of fire. If you want somewhere to marvel at the world's greatest river, Tissasat is the place to be. It's here that the Blue Nile plunges 150 feet into a chasm. It's the first time that Ishitu and his family have ever seen so much water in one spot. Remember, this is an arid country, plagued by drought. To most pilgrims, this is a miracle. You know what I'll do now? I think I'll go down and have a really nice shower. Under the slightly sceptical eye of this young shepherd, I make my way down to the ultimate shower scene. We're in the middle of the dry season. The falls are at their lowest ebb. Imagine what it's like around here when it rains.
They call it the river of life. The Blue Nile provides 80% of the water for the Nile proper. If these falls ever stopped, millions would starve to death for a thousand miles downstream from here. turning a shower into a religious experience. Although I suspect Ishitu and little Jordanus think I've lost my mind. I don't know about them, but this pilgrim's feeling very much rejuvenated. Oh my God, that was like standing in the middle of a hurricane. This is like, just the most fantastic feeling. It's, it's everything about Africa. My God, come and stand under the Nile Falls. Oh. That afternoon, we go into Tissasat village to stock up on food. And in a country that's often stricken by drought, the choice is never huge. You need some potatoes? No shrimps to chuck on the barbie here. Basically, it's potatoes, tomatoes and onions but they're fresh. Anyway, Tete and Ababa seem to know what they're looking for. However, there doesn't seem to be much in the way of meat. But then meat is a luxury in North Africa. It's a particularly bad one. Besides, as pilgrims, we should live and eat frugally to gain maximum redemption in the eyes of the Lord. But after seven days on the pilgrim's trail, I must say I could eat a horse. <laughs> this is the local staple, a flatbread called injera. It's made from millet and appears at every meal. When someone shares food with you, it's a great compliment. But when they actually put it in your mouth, it means affection. Gustus are respected, and if the food is around here, we must do like this. Oh, okay, thank you. Ah! Mmm. By now, I'm getting to know Ishitu and his family. Normally, a pilgrimage would be a very private family event. So they've been generous indeed to let me tag along. You know, a lot of countries in the world don't have, have pilgrimages at all. And a lot of people, I think, find it very strange that people are still walking hundreds of miles for religious reasons. Well, here in Ethiopia, we have a lot of pilgrims. And we came from different parts of Ethiopia. and. They visit the monastery church, but this is my first time with my kids and my wife. Back on the Nile, and a tiny river port that could be straight out of the African Queen. While Ishitu and family go ahead on foot, I am making a detour to follow up a new lead on the ark. I'm told that when the ark was brought to Ethiopia, it came up past this spot. They tell me there's an island on a lake upstream where the ark is supposed to have been kept for 800 years. Some say it's still there. So I need a boat, and the best way to get one around here is to have one made. They're making papyrus canoes in a manner unchanged in 3,000 years. I've seen similar craft on the River Tigris, on the Caspian Sea, and on the Andean lakes of South America. How the same idea spread so far, we just don't know. So whatever the reason for their design, it's obvious that these little craft have played a huge role in moving people around the globe. 
given they've been around for about 3,000 years, it'll probably hold together just long enough to get me out on Lake Tana to find that equally mysterious Ark of the Covenant. I launched my canoe on the Blue Nile. It was going to be the toughest 20 miles of my pilgrimage. So far, so good, but it's definitely a workout. In the wet season, I'd never stand a chance. With so much water flooding the river, I'd be swept downstream to oblivion. As for papyrus canoes, well, they're extremely buoyant, a little sluggish, but surprisingly stable. This is an Ethiopian river community that few Westerners ever get to see. Gone is the arid landscape. This one is rich, fertile and well watered. Five miles down, 15 still to go. And as the seventh day of Christmas turns to dusk, with arms aching, I look for a place to camp. I know exactly where I am. This GPS monitor uses navigation satellites to tell me. Compared with the great explorers, it feels a little like cheating. The reading tells me that tomorrow I must paddle another 15 miles east northeast to an island on Lake Tana, the most secret hiding place of the lost ark. Morning on the eighth day of an Ethiopian Christmas, and I'm back on the river of life, the Blue Nile of Ethiopia in North Africa. I'm now heading out of the river onto one of the great freshwater resources on Earth, Lake Tana. Remember, most of the water that flows down the Blue Nile comes from here, and that's a lot of water. This is an extraordinary place. I'm on a lake that's 60 times the size of Manhattan. It has more water than all of Britain's inland waterways and lakes put together, and is 2,000 metres, or 6,000 feet, above sea level. By now, the paddling is starting to take its toll. Somewhere on this lake is the lost Ark of the Covenant, held in a monastery. And according to legend, this time it's the real one. There are 34 islands on this lake, and 20 of them have monasteries. The island I'm seeking is Tanakirkos, and of course, it would have to be the most remote of all the islands on Lake Tana. Christian monks have lived here for 1,500 years. Not a bad place to hide the ark. 
By now, my arms feel like jelly. I arrive on my waterlogged bundle of reeds. The only sign of life are vultures, peering down like gargoyles from a medieval church. But they're not the only ones watching me. My sixth sense tells me I'm under surveillance. But by now, I don't care. When I land, all I hear is the lapping of water. I'm ashore and looking forward to using my feet again. Welcome to Tana Kirkos. The silence is oppressive. Then I see something that confirms the presence of ancient people, stones once used as a sacrificial altar. The holes were to catch the blood of a calf or lamb, but animal sacrifice was only practiced by the early Christian church in Ethiopia. This means the monastery has been here for a very long time. Long enough to hide an object last seen over two and a half thousand years ago? Perhaps. And then I see them, the keepers of the lost ark. These monks have obviously been expecting me. Hello. They're clearly quite relaxed about my presence, so I come straight to the point. I understand that the Ark of the Covenant was kept here, or first came here when it came to Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. what, what date was that? How long ago was the Ark brought here? Okay, I don't know what I'm talking about. 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 I don't Maybe I came to the point too abruptly. I don't think that first question went down too well. I'm not sure if they're arguing about the date or whether they should be talking to me at all. Finally, a deacon translates. 982 years before just Christ was born. Yeah, born. And where is it on the island? Where is it kept? Yet no, we take a mat on Now I think I've really done it. The atmosphere becomes definitely cool. I have the distinct impression that my question and answer session is about to come to an abrupt end. There was a lot of trying to stole this, uh, mm -hmm. stole the ark. Because of that, everybody even... Thieves have tried to steal the ark, he explains. So they've had to hide it by putting it under divine protection. So it is somewhere on the island, in one of the buildings here, but no one knows where. Yeah. So it's hidden. Still here, yeah, hidden, yeah. Ah, OK. So even if they knew, mm -hmm where the ark was on the island, they're not going to tell me? Mm -hmm. no. Yes, that's, that's what, what they mean, you know? Ah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Their attitude is simple. All the other arks in Ethiopia are fakes, used to fool thieves. The real ark is here, on the island, and they don't have to prove it to anyone, least of all me. So as I paddle away from Tanakurkos, in a canoe that seems even more sluggish, I leave yet another home of the so-called One True Ark. And I think I was right the first time. I'm not dealing with reality, I'm dealing with a legend. But I also wonder if that's the real issue. The twelfth day of Christmas is fast approaching. Soon I'll get as close as any skeptic can ever get to the truth of the lost ark.
It's the 10th day of Christmas, and at last we're approaching the end of our Ethiopian pilgrimage. Since we began on Christmas Day, we've walked 200 miles. That's 320 kilometers. Now we reach our final destination, Gonda, the African Camelot. And after so many days on the road, this former Ethiopian capital comes as an intoxicating relief. Gonda reached the peak of its power in the 16th century. From this castle, the Ethiopian emperors, protected by warrior horsemen, wielded absolute power. Ethiopian emperors were always in awe of another superior force, the spiritual might of Ethiopian orthodoxy. And still today, we should never underestimate the power of the Orthodox Church in this country. Even at the beginning of the 21st century, it is still incredibly profound here. Not far away, Ishitu and his family are entering the most famous church in North Africa to pray. They must purify themselves for tomorrow. This church is called the Deborah Brihan Selassie, built in the 16th century, and it's famous for its frescoes. And note how they pray, not unlike the prayer rituals of Islam. The fresco is of the three wise men who showed the baby Jesus to the world. That moment is what Timcat is all about. And as the sun sets over Gonda, the atmosphere is charged with intense religious fervor. It's why the pilgrims are still flocking into town, all of them seeking redemption. Next morning, it's the start of Timcat. Religious passions explode in the streets. For the next two days, there are similar celebrations all over Ethiopia. It's the biggest ceremony in the Orthodox calendar. For Ishitu and his family, it's the culmination of their pilgrimage. But for me, it's a little different. Because it's at Timcat when the most sacred objects of Ethiopian Christendom are put on show. This is as close as you and I will ever get to the mystery of the lost ark. Resting on the priests' heads are tablets, the tablets upon which God is supposed to have written the Ten Commandments. But there seem to be rather a lot of them, so which ones are genuine? Then I'm told that each tablet comes from a different church in Gonda. Each is believed to have the power of the Ark, which is why they're covered in cloth. If anyone other than their guardian priest sees them, they'll be instantly consumed by fire. At least that's what the faithful believe. Over Ethiopia, hundreds of tablets are being paraded, each with the same powers, 
each supposedly inscribed with the laws of Moses as writ by the finger of God. And here at last, I'm beginning to understand what they're on about. This isn't about reality, it's about faith. You don't ask God to prove his existence, so why ask the same of the ark? And it's that faith that's brought the pilgrims to Gonda. It's why Ishitu, his family and I, have walked all this way. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it very much, very, very much. Really, I don't have what to tell you about what <laughs> yeah. I enjoyed. Tete, what did you think? You enjoyed it? Yeah. That's the village I know in time, and please enjoy it. Would you think you'll come back next year? Well, maybe I will come with my friends uh, to visit this place because I enjoyed very much yeah. about Timcat or Ipfany. Yeah. As the festival reaches its climax on the 12th day of Christmas, the drums beat incessantly. The priests bless the crowd as the most sacred moment of the Epiphany ceremony unfolds. They push a raft out into the lake. The candles are both a sign and a symbol. The symbol is the giving of life to the Saviour, and the sign is for everyone to repeat their christening. Water flies everywhere, and while it's a moment of deep religious significance, I can't help thinking it's also about having a good time. of the Ark of the Covenant? Well, the Ark didn't show, but its contents did. And after a brief appearance, they'll be returned once more to a life of seclusion until next year's Timcat. So if you come to Ethiopia, you may not find the Ark, but you will find the Covenant, that agreement between God and humanity. It's everywhere, in ceremonies like this all over Ethiopia. It's in the hearts and minds of the Ethiopian people. But right now, it's the mouths and stomachs of a group of pilgrims that's concerning us most. After so much walking, I reckon we've earned enough redemption for some of the pleasures of life. We're looking forward to this, I tell you. <laughs> and a toast to little Jordanus, the youngest member of the group, always happy, always smiling. And sadly, it's time to say goodbye to my pilgrim friends. And as they head back to Lalabella, I head off to reflect. I'd done 200 miles across these magnificent highlands. I'd visited some of Ethiopia's most sacred places, and I'd got a real insight into the soul of this ancient land. As for the legend of the Lost Ark, well, it was exactly what I expected it to be. A legend, an article of faith that sits somewhere between myth and metaphor. And while it is fact and logic that makes the Western world tick, it's that wonderful mixture of faith and legend that's forever keeping me going on my journeys to the ends of the earth. <laughs>